So where'd you get your singing voice there from, Brenda? Does your mama sing like that? And I Oh, is that what it is? Okay, that's that's cool. That's cool. Hey, real quick, Evan and uh, Dave, could you make an announcement for us about, please? Come on up. All right, brother. Okay, so Wednesday night we have prayer meeting, and I am going to encourage you and invite you to be a part of that, whether you're here or not, but we really want you here. We want to be able to get out of that room, hold about 20 we want to be able to come and hear and say, that's how many people we have for praying. The power of the Holy Spirit moving is going to happen when we collectively, as a congregation, pray. So I'm inviting each and every one of you to get here on Wednesday night. Also, we're praying before service at 830, um, each and every Sunday, but uh, we want you here on Wednesday nights to pray. Amen. What room are we praying in we're, Sunday morning? Uh, in the room that I'm teaching in on number is... 106. 106 is there we go, 106. The other thing is, I'm trying to get rid of potatoes. I really appreciate Ed's ministry, but we have some leftover potatoes, so if you would like to, if you're Irish, is that, is that racial, saying that you're Irish and potatoes? I don't know, I don't know. But Anyway, uh, we have a bunch of these. Please take them. If you have family, friends, uh, people you hate, whatever, um, you're more than welcome to. Also, before uh, you men leave today, we have a, a special gift for you. It's candy. You might as well turn it over to your wife because you know she's going to get it anyway. So with that in mind, hey, um, you know, every time there's a football game and the football players go, hi, mom, you know, always. They never mention dad. So dads, we are going to do like what we did for Mother's Day, which is you're going to recognize if you want to just say something about your dad or say something about your heavenly father, either one. But we're going to take some time to do that. And then I'm going to sit there and give you what I got, uh, what the Lord gave to me this week. OK, so we'll start. Is there anybody that wants to testify or yes. We're bringing a mic to you, baby. Don't. Oh, you need some stinking yes. mic. There we go. There you go. Amen, sis. Thank you. Who else? Come on, don't be shy. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. I paid him. I paid him. I want to let you know. I am just so thankful to be sitting here right now. I'm sitting here thinking, and I, I look at the image I had of my grandfather. I was seven when he passed, but I just, the Bible says a good man is an inheritance of his children's children. And I think that not a material that is giving that knowledge of kind of like what I said, giving that knowledge of God, of having that relationship with Christ. So, Dad, thanks for being a kingdom man, because there's dads and there's kingdom men, and you certainly are kingdom men. So, thank you. Lead my example, not just saying it, but doing it. I love you. Thank you. You too. Who else? Over here, Larry. You get a mic, Larry. There you go. Amen. Amen. Who else? And you will see them, love. I also, as our first daughter, want to thank him. And I want to thank the Lord for giving us a wonderful father who was our rock our whole life. And he was just such an example of a man and a husband and a father. And how he drove us to church every Sunday. And I would be one of Knowing the Lord. If it wasn't for my father making sure we got to church, uh, dedicating my life to the Lord, 
So I'm just so thankful. Amen. 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 Who else this morning? Who else? Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, we got. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, I want to say a couple words about my father. Uh, he was very humble and kind and soft spoken. And I was not growing up, but he didn't want to told me to sit down and shut up. <laughs> and, um, I'm grateful to be raised by him. Amen. I'm thankful for my father that a month before he passed, he accepted the Lord, and what a change. Amen. I just give all the praise to my Heavenly Father. Amen. This is my first Father's Day without Dad. But he was an incredible man. And in his very last days, he made sure that we all knew to be rejoicing and celebrating his life. Because in his own words, he's been planning his entire life to spend eternity in heaven with his father. And there's no greater gift that a father can give you than to love, love your mother. Amen. And That's today right. was their anniversary, so I know he's smiling down on all of us today. We love you, hon. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Well, we'll praise the Lord for that. All right. We, um, can I get my remote control? I made a rookie mistake. I gave the woman the control, the remote. <laughs> Who said that? <sighs> and you wonder why you're not married yet. <laughs> You love our kid. You know, she's gorgeous. She's wonderful. She loves the Lord, but she has this control issues about remotes. I don't know. Anyway, so that was all uncalled for, but you know I love you. All right. With that in mind, I need someone special because we need, to, first of all, celebrate Father's Day, but I want to celebrate because, you know, men think differently and Women that are married, I'm going to bring up a woman that's a seasoned woman, a woman that sits there and, you know, this ain't her first rodeo. She's been married for a long time, so she's a veteran, okay, that she can translate what, because many times men communicate, but women, you know, they mean something totally different. So women have to have that ability to be able to grasp what the man says. So, Connie, come on up, would you? Come on up. I put her impromptu. I actually asked three other cowards, and they wouldn't come up. So, <laughs> oh, did I say cowards? Did I say it right? Yeah, cowards. That, that was right. My daughter, she didn't come. Yeah, real cowards. Cowards they were. I know. I know, but I love you for it. with the servant's heart thing. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, throw that out there. It just breaks the people. You know what I'm saying? Are you ready? Well, you can see it, everything on the front screen. This is called the men's thesis. You can't see that? Oh, thank God. <laughs> What's your prescription, girl? I mean, next is bottle caps. But anyway, okay, here we go. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. When a man says it would take too long to explain, what does he mean? He means that, <laughs> he, means that he just wants you to do it. He means I have no idea how it works. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So you get the idea here. Now you get going. You just go let your mind go how your husband thinks. Okay. Yeah. That's scary. It's, it's going down dark corridors. Yes. Here we go. Here's the second one. When a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard. What does that mean? He doesn't want you to do it. Well, that means he means I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Is what it means. So you, you're close. You're you're close. You're close. Are you ready for number two? Yeah, uh, number three. When a man says that's interesting, dear, what does he really mean? He wants you to shut up. He means, are you still talking? Yeah. There you go. Okay. So that's correct. Yes. 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 It's but these are very good perceptions you've got. Okay. When a man says it's a guy thing, 
What's that mean? What? It's a guy thing. You don't want to know. He means there's no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance at all of making it logical. That's what he means by that. <laughs> all right, that's, that's what a man, man's thinking, okay? When a man says, can I help with dinner, what does that mean? He means, do you want to go out? He means, why, isn't it ready yet? <laughs> It is so true. I mean, it is so true, you know. Okay, are you ready? You're, you're doing okay, okay? Man, these ones that weren't married for a long time, it would have been way over their head. Yeah, I know, I know. I, you're doing fine. When a man says, you know how bad my memory is. Yeah, he, does, he doesn't want to listen. He doesn't care to listen in the first place. Very close. He means this. He means I can remember the theme song to Hogan's Heroes, the phone number of my first girl I ever kissed, and the vehicle identification numbers of every car I ever owned. But yes, I did forget your birthday. <laughs> so that's what he means by that. It's very important for you to understand that. All right? When a man says, oh, don't fuss. I just cut myself. It's no big deal. What does oh he mean? Goodness. Call an ambulance. And it's a You're very Yes, he means I probably severed a limb. But I will bleed to death before I admit I'm hurt, so get over here and help me, okay? There you go, all right? You ready for the next one? You're, you're, you're doing good, okay? You're... When a man says, I can't find it, what does he mean? He means he's not going to look for it, you find it. Very close. He, he says, he means if it don't fall into my outstretched hand, I am completely clueless. Okay, all right. When a man says, you know, I could never love anyone else, what does he mean by that? You better really mean that. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe is watching this live, so okay, and there's truth to that. Yes, he is. He means I am used to the way you yell at me and realize it could be worse. Could be worse, all right? Very important. When a man says, I am lost, I know, uh, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, what does that mean? I am totally lost, I don't have a clue, and I will not ask anyone. That was from the movie Deliverance, and he means no one will ever see us alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. Okay, so anyway, when a man says, that's not what I meant, what does he mean? He doesn't know what he means either. He means, if something I said can be interpreted two ways, and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other one. <laughs> that is a very good job. Now, you get a candy bar for that. There you go. Do not share this with... Oh, wait a minute. You get a candy bar, love. Well, don't give it to those girls that turn me down back there. <laughs> don't you dare. All right? All right. Take your Bibles with me. Men think differently, don't they? Whoa. <laughs> and women think a little bit differently. Amen, men? Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Some of you guys are going to have rib damage after the service, but such is life. You know, I sit there myself, and I sit there and thought, how do you pass on a legacy? How do you pass on a legacy, all right? Because, you know, most times you get Father's Day, it's like, oh, man, I'm time to get beat up. You know, just uh, sit there and, you know, let's talk about how we've screwed up. Let's talk about this. And same for Mother's Day. And you sometimes feel like, man, you know, in, in Parenthood is not for the faint of heart. Come on. Is it? All right? I look in the Bible, and I look where God was perfect, and Adam and Eve were in a perfect environment. And guess what? They still chose to go their own way. You look at the book of Isaiah, and he says, I raised my children, referring to Israel, and they rebelled against me. Now, you can't do better than God. So sometimes... Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility, but it also means that when we're born, okay, we have free will, and we can sit there and instill in our lives and instill in other people's lives, but they still have a what? A choice. Folks, that's why I'm so anti this Calvinist idea that, you know, that, you know, God chose certain people to go to heaven, certain people to go to hell, because people have free choice. Everyone, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I thought today, even though this is Father's Day and some of it's drilled more to the idea of men, 
how do we leave a legacy? And, and I was reading because I'm trying to read the Bible through in a year, and this was in my text this week, okay? So it is a text which talks about this, and I'm going to let you look at the verses here real quick. Um, in Proverbs 26, before I start, most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? Who can find a faithful man? You know, our nation has been reeling for years. You know, when I was growing up, now I know, oh, now we're going back to the, some of the teenagers aren't here because they're all on a missions trip. Um, you know, oh, we're going back to the horse and buggy, you know, uh, back to the one phone in the house, you know, back to the black and white TV, you know. But when I was growing up, seriously, I grew up in Perry schools and I remember being in classes and I was the majority. And you say, what do you mean? Well, most everybody had parents that were together, you know, same dad, same mom. Nowadays, you talk to most of the teachers, and at least what we see, they're usually the minority that, in the sense that the parents aren't together anymore. Who can find a faithful man? Man, there's a definition of all kinds of faithful men. You know what I'm saying? What makes up a faithful man or woman? Well, what is that? What is the ingredient here? What, what, what's the super glue? What, 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 is the, what, what is the detail that comes up in that? Well, David, I sit there and I look at this guy. King David. Everybody knows King David, right? Everybody knows this guy, right? All right. He's a man after God's own what? Man, think about that. He's a man after God's own heart. He loved God. But I also look at his life, and he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. In his family, his one son, Absalom, killed his other brother, and his other brother raped his sister. And then Absalom tries to take over the kingdom. And you look and say, wow. David had a lot of ramifications for his sins. But still, the Bible says only this, only time ever, he was a man after God's own heart. David screwed up but he still could be a man after God's own heart. Sometimes we have a tendency to look in our lives and we sit there and say, you know what, I've really messed this up. I've really messed this up. And we have a tendency, and, and now you're saying, well, pastor, you're minimizing sin. I'm not minimizing sin. Sin has its own consequences. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that, you know what, even when we fail, you could still be a man or a woman after God's own heart, depending on how you are pursuing him. David sits there, and every time you look at David's life, he never sit there and justified his sin. He never sit there, and when, when he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar, all right? He didn't sit there and say, you know, I, it was really uh, Bathsheba, man. She was she, she had bad news, man. She, 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 she was dressing a little bit too, too, uh, too seductive that day for me. You know what I'm saying? It's a woman's problem. No, he sat there and said, listen, I have sinned, Okay? He always took what? He manned up. We live in a generation where it's not my fault. I grew up this way. I grew up in this situation. I grew up with this problem. It's society's fault where we don't take accountability. You know what? We are accountable. You are accountable. That's what needs to be drilled in. We've been into a society where, hey, it ain't my fault, but that's not what the Word of God says. Word of God says... You and I have to man up or woman up. And the secret of David's success was he sit there and said, listen, I sinned. Not I made a mistake. Not I made, I dropped the ball. Not I did, oh, that was it. He said, I was wrong with what God said. Now, David is an old man, all right? He's on his deathbed. How many's heard a lot of deathbed confessions? Anybody? I hear a lot. Okay, um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but when I say deathbed confessions, they can be good. They can be bad. Sometimes, like your dad, I'm gonna. He sat there and he wanted to make sure not only everybody coming in that room, but he also wanted to make sure that every one of you knew what the rules were to live by. And David is at his last place. He says, listen, I've lived my life, and that's what this text is about. He says, listen, Solomon, which is his son, 
I need you to know what you need to do. Each one of us have to sit there and I, I think about my life, how quick it's rolled by. Come on, what about you guys? Remember the long hair you had? Remember when we were like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds less? Do you remember when you didn't sit there and you could talk or you, you didn't yawn and you thought you were in traction for three days because you pulled something? Come on. I remember this little lady I used to take care of, Lucille Walters says, she, she says it's a good life if you, don't, if you don't weaken. There's truth to that, you know? David's sitting there saying, listen, Solomon, this is what you need to do. He said, now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Now, the question is, what's a man? Now, a man in our society is a whole lot different perception than what was years ago. I look at, I look at my father, okay? You know, and, and everybody's father is the best father. Usually, <laughs> there's some cases where, oh my goodness, you got, you know, um, Charles Manson. But besides that, all right, you think about how they grew up, all right? Many of them came up from the Great Depression, like my father, okay? Um, he ended up growing up in West Virginia. He brought home this basically a sickness. Sickness uh, killed Wayne, which is my middle name, Wayne, Wayne Drain. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Um, Wayne was seven years old. Dad was 14. His mom got mad, said, you're out of the house, even though he just brought home a childhood sickness. He ended up moving to Warren, Ohio, where he was raised by Aunt Vivian. War breaks out. Dad lies about his age, and he goes in the U.S. Navy. During the U.S. Navy, he ends up getting hooked to alcohol. Um... But he served. He was on two ships. Both of them got sunk. Well, the Bunker Hill didn't. It just got nailed. Okay. Dad used to ask me, what, what does that tell you, son? Not to get on a boat with you, Dad. <laughs> um, but I look at my dad, and, and my dad, when, when people, whenever Jimmy Boggs or kids were in the neighborhood, he'd drive up because he'd come home about the same time, 4.30 from General Motors, worked at Coit Road. He'd pull in the drive in, like kids would disappear. <laughs> you know, he was considered the mean guy. You know what I'm saying? My dad was a marshmallow inside. Mom was the one that was Stalin. You would never know it, okay? Mom had a killer instinct, okay? She had the eyes that could eat through you, you know? And you just were basically needed to go change your pants, okay? It was one of those deals. Now, come on. I'm just telling the truth. But dad could scare the stop. But dad had a sentinel side. And when he got saved, it did not automatically, like he, he was a new creation right away, but he changed over time as he grew to know the word, okay? But I look at my dad and what my dad did even before when he was saved and he was growing, the one thing was he always made sure he took care of us. We didn't have all the big extras. We didn't have mini bikes. We didn't have these. We didn't have that. But we had three meals a day. You know what I mean? And my dad would go and do put on the same thing every day with the assembly line at General Motors. You get people that, I'm bored with it. I don't want to do this. You know, I, I look at the, the sacrifice that many men and women make, okay, to take care of their own. To take welfare would have been an insult to his generation. To take out a government handout to sit there and live by somebody else's standard would have been a shame. The Bible tells us that many, that a man or woman, but let me show you this verse. I'm going to skip through some things here. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith as worse than an unbeliever. We live in a day and age where, you know what, men do not want to take responsibility. You'll get men sometimes they'll complain. They'll sit there and they'll have a child and they complain, well, you know, oh, I can't believe this much is coming out. You know what? It's your responsibility. 
ooh, I'm not going to be a happy pe people happy today. It is our responsibilities to take care of our family. Well, they're taking too much. You know what? May be the case, but guess what? That's what you've been ordered to do. Men need to step up and be the role leaders in, people, in the life of the family. My dad sat there, and I tell you something, what? he drove some junky cars. You know what? Come on, your dads did the same thing too. I don't remember my dad going out and buying a boat and all this other stuff and us going without. We, he took care of business. And I tell you, when I looked at his life, I appreciated that. One thing that she said back there that I'll never, what, what uh, uh, Brenda said, the one thing I get from my dad, he loved my mama. Now that I know. That's the greatest gift he ever gave me. He loved my mom. Okay? Now, they had a different fairy hood idea sometimes because I'll tell you what, I remember sometimes dad and mom said, oh, we never fight in front of you kids. I'm thinking, man, I don't know what house I grew up at. <laughs> Because there were some good nights out there, I got yelling, you know. It was like, you know, you know, you know, I thought it was leave it to Cleaver or something. Leave it, you know, I'm thinking, man, I got a doctor. I don't know what happened. You know, these people would say, I never fight. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about you, okay? <laughs> I'm just a little concerned, okay? Because you're going to be the one taking a knife and nailing somebody someday because you're going to blow up, you know? The Bible says that you and I have to take care. And I tell you what, when we look in, we need to thank our fathers. And if you didn't have a father, thank your mother for, you know what, taking on that role that she shouldn't have had to do and working. You know, the second thing we see in here, it says, it says in verse 3, it says, keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statute, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies as is written in the law of Moses. He says, Solomon, when the rubber hits the road, David says, listen, son, you need to listen to what God told you to do. Today, we have men that do not teach their children what to do. They teach other things. They teach, you know, that, that these events are more important or these, these are events. The Bible says very specifically, fathers, do not ask, ask for each your children. It basically means don't tick them off. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You know, I don't get it. You guys know how bad and evil it is out there. Now, come on. When, when we're going to schools right now, giving backpacks out, and kids are able to sit there in kindergartners and, and kindergartners first grade, and can sit there and say, well, I'm a boy today or a girl tomorrow, and those teachers can't do nothing. you got to just love the kids because they're in that situation, okay? You tell me that's not evil out there? You tell me that our president that just sit there and agreed to uh, same-sex change, uh, uh, sex change paid by the military for the VA hospitals just approved? There's not wickedness out there? You tell me 2% of the population can control 100% of the legislation, which has happened? And yet, we can only do so much. And we have good people, but you don't see kids. It ain't my fault. I brought my kids. Where are we at in our mindset? We were thinking the world is more important. You, you could slice it, dice it. You can challenge it all in your mind. You could do this, 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 this. But when it comes down to it, we are just part of the tool. And if you're not getting it from here, where are you really doing it at home? And that's what it talks about, faithful instruction. You go to Deuteronomy. He says you're supposed to talk about these things daily. You're supposed to talk about when you go to sleep. It says you and I are supposed to talk about God. i tell you what, my father, okay, as he was growing, he grew in Christ. My dad was very racial. Anybody that was not a hillbilly, he had an issue with. Italian, Irish, didn't matter. Black, white, Chinese, he was. He was just racial. Grew up with it. But as he continued to grow in Christ, he changed. I've told you the story before, but it's a true story. 
I was at Lake Erie College. I had a room, or not a roommate, I had a lady that was helping me on a project. Nice black girl. I said, you got to do me a favor. You come home and pretend to be my girlfriend. And on top of it all, she had a Yugo, because my dad hated foreign cars. So she comes up, she drives in Coral Road, pulls in with her Yugo. Thank God she didn't have to push it, because it was a piece of junk. Yugos were horrible, if you all remember those cars. She pulls in. We get out. We walk hand in hand into the house. We sit down. Dad gives me a Pepsi. It was lemon, I remember. Pepsi with lemon. I don't know if you remember that glad, but it was short-lived Pepsi. And I remember drinking. It's just sweet to her. We walk out. She gives me a peck on the cheek. She takes off. Car hardly starts, but she takes off. I come in. I sit down. He walks up. Smack! Don't you ever bring a Yugo in this yard again. My dad learned to love people of all kinds of races because when you learn to know Jesus Christ, you understand that there is only one race, and that's the human race. So you grow in Christ. The things that you used to do, it starts changing. Why? Because he will not leave you where you're supposed to, where you were. And you are a different person than you were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Sometimes God does it like this in a person's life very quickly because that person is really just wanting to know God. And he changes and absorbs it. Some people, it takes longer. But I can look back and sit there and say, you know what? There was an example. Here's a sad confession of one father. I took my children to school, but not to church. I taught them to drink, but not of the living water. I enrolled them in the Little League, but not Sunday school. I showed them how to fish, but not to be fisher of men. I made the Lord's Day a holiday rather than a holy day. I taught them the church was full of hypocrites and the greater hypocrite of them and me. I gave them color tea, but provided no Bible. I handed them the keys to the car, but did not give to them the keys of the kingdom of God. I taught them how to make a living, but failed to bring them to Christ, who alone can make a life. And that's the legacy, because we have a generation between 20 and 35 that's lost. Now, I'm very thankful that we have a lot of young college folks, okay? We do. We're blessed. We do. I'm, I'm very thankful for that leadership of Bill Walker and and Joe Reaney, and uh, just, j just the ladies there, too. Um, I'm very appreciative of you folks. But with that in mind, we have a jet, we're that close of a generation being away from God. It's that close. We have to protect it. We have to, at all, all courses. Thirdly, thank God and thank our parents for the godly illustration. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You know, Lord willing, you know you could sit there and tell a kid over and over and over again, but if they know that you're doing it, what do they do? They'll bring it up on you, right? Kids are like sharp, are attorneys, aren't they? They're like born attorneys. They can argue the case very well. Yeah, even this kid's going, yeah, I can do it pretty good. Put me in front of the Supreme Court. Yes, they can. They can sit there and know when something's not correct. So you could sit there and say something to your blue in the face, but unless you live it. I remember one time, my dad, uh, I stole. <laughs> I love payday bars. Amen? I love payday bars. Don't get me wrong. You get that little nugget and that peanut butter, and that, I, was, I was in home. And I remember taking one. Okay, from Ben Franklin, not the not the actual president, but then you guys are going to say, man, that guy No, there was a Ben Franklin store in Madison. Anybody remember Ben Franklin? Okay, thank you. Some of these young people are going, man, he really is old. He played New Washington, you know. I, okay, so I sit there and I, you know, confiscated it. <laughs> Notice how I changed the wording. I didn't steal. I confiscated it, and I remember coming out. And dad's sitting there saying, you know what? You've stolen. I had to go into Ben Franklin's with that candy bar, go up to the manager of the store, apologize, and give that candy bar back. I never forgot that. 
But I could never sit there and say, Dad, you stole. I remember one time when we were on the turnpike, we stopped, waited before Easy Pass, and Dad got, um, Dad at that point, we we drive up, he gives uh, basically, I don't know what it was, $10, $20, whatever it was on the turnpike, and this was close in Texas, and I remember they gave him too much money back. I don't know how they screwed it up, but they gave him almost $30 back. And so we're going down Turnpike. He says to mom, you know, they gave me too much money. He went 20 miles to the next exit, turned around, went back, and paid it. I'll never forget that because he believed it. Folks, that's the type of things that we need to do for our children. We need to show godly character. David was saying to Solomon, Solomon, listen, you have a choice. You can live a life. Matter of fact, this, this wording that he says here is out of Deuteronomy chapter 29. I just want to read this, and I'm going to close to you real quick. But in Deuteronomy 29, he sits there and he charges Israel and says, listen, you guys are getting ready to go in the promised land. I'm going to be with you, okay? We're going to be peanut butter and jelly. This is my version of the Bible, okay? We're we going to be thick and thin. But he says, if you sit there and you don't obey, I'm just going to let sin have its natural course on you. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, lost my glasses. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter not, uh, 29, he talks about that if they don't, he says in verse 24, all nations will say, what has the Lord done to this land? Why does the, um, why does the, the, this a great anger, heat of the great anger mean? Later on in chapter 30, he sits there and says this. He says, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He says, therefore choose life that you both, you and your descendants may live. In Deuteronomy 28, he says, if you do this, I'm going to bless you. If you do this, I'm going to bless you. If you do this, I'm going to bless you. If you do this, I'm going to bless you. He gives blessings to the nation by saying, listen, I'm going to bless your families. I'm going to bless your agriculture. I'm going to bless your political scene. I'm going to bless you with uh, all protection. Then he sits there and says, if you don't do this, I'm going to basically let everything go. Boom, 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 boom. Let your own gods figure it out. Now, what happened to Israel? They did exactly that. What's happening in the United States? We forgot where we came from. We're doing the same thing. It's interesting that one of the verses in Deuteronomy says that the alien will rule over you. Interesting verse. With that in mind, at the end of this whole thing, he sits there and says, listen, you have a choice. You can choose life or you can choose death. Folks, all of us have a choice. You have a choice right now this morning, man or woman, to live a godly life. How do you do it? It comes down to you and I submitting to the Word of God, to be able to willing to grow in Him. That means each day dying to ourselves. That means each day being in the Word. That means each day making a priority instead of the things of this world a priority. I ain't going to say it's easy, but nothing worthwhile is easy. Something that's free, like just thrown at you, your freedom that you have today was not something easy. It was earned by the blood of men and women throughout the ages. Your salvation, even though it was free, cost a heavy price. As we sang, oh, the blood of Jesus rescued me. Folks, you have to make a decision. Do you want to choose to live or do you want to choose to die? You make your own choice. And David told Solomon, so what did Solomon do with this? In the first part of his life, he followed God like peanut butter and jelly. But at one point, he sat there and he started worshiping other gods. And eventually the kingdom was torn from him. It's interesting, the book of Ecclesiastes, if you ever get a chance to read it, it almost sounds like it's being written by a guy who's suicidal. 
He's reading, the, he's writing this book, and he's saying, listen, I have everything. I have women, I have houses, I have horses, I've built everything I want, I have aqueducts, I've done this, 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 I've built gardens, I've done this, this, this. But when it's all said and done, I feel like just killing myself. But eventually, at the end of the book, he says, listen, I finally figured it back out. He got back to his first love. He says, the bottom of life is this. Here's a whole conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is a whole duty of man. Maybe you've lost track like Solomon. Maybe you've sit there and forgot your first love. You can come back. Because you know what? With God, there's always a brand new fresh start. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, I love you. And I thank you so much for this time we've had. And Father, as I want to thank you, Father, for that, Father, you are a God. But Father, even though we sin, you forgive. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be peachy and cream and doesn't mean that many times our ramifications still has a price to pay. There are times that you, you make it lighter. There are times you do take it away. But there are also times that you sit there and make us go through it to draw us closer, to show your love to us. Please, Help us understand what your love is for us and what understand what your purpose is. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.